From the time of his arrest until his crucifixion, a whole lot happened in a very short space of time for Jesus. In this episode, I try to make a little bit of sense of it. Stay tuned. Hello friends, Pastor Tim Westermeyer here, Senior Pastor of St. Philip the Deacon in the western suburbs of Minneapolis. Good to be with you as always. Uh, we are still in the season of Lent uh, here in 2022. And let's see, I'm taping this on the 28th of March. Uh, it'll air on the 29th of March. On the 30th of March, that's a Wednesday, we will gather again here for our Holden Evening Prayer Lenten service and soup supper. If you see this before then, we hope you'll join us for that. Uh, we are following along sort of broadly uh, the chapters of Adam Hamilton's book, 24 Hours That Changed the World. And this coming Wednesday, um, the chapter that we're focused on is called Jesus, Barabbas, and Pilate. So it's the scene where uh, Jesus is being tried before Pilate, and eventually um, a prisoner named Barabbas is freed because that's one of the things that happens at this time of year as part of the Passover festival. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly, I, I'm preaching on Wednesday night, by the way. Uh, if you wanna know how what I'm talking about right now turns into a sermon for Wednesday, uh, join us on Wednesday and find out. But I'm sitting with all of this and as we sit here the day of this taping, I'm actually reminded of um, a conversation I had as a young boy with my pastor. So I grew up in the western suburbs of Chicago. My family uh, went to a small Lutheran church there. I had the same pastor from when I was baptized as a little infant until I left for college and actually beyond. Um, and I remember, and I guess, again, the title of the book is 24 Hours That Changed the World. And the 24 hours are from Last Supper to Jesus' death on the cross on Good Friday. Uh, but backing up a bit, and we talked about this before, um, the Sunday before that 24 hours was what we Christians call Palm Sunday. Uh, and so that's when Jesus rides triumphantly into Jerusalem, the shouts of Hosanna and uh, blessed be the King, uh, blessed be the Messiah and so forth. Um, and I remember talking to my pastor as a young kid and asking, what the heck happened? I mean, everyone loved him on Sunday and now it's the morning of what we call Good Friday. And in this trial scene, again, with Pilate and Barabbas and, and so forth, all the same crowds seem to be shouting for his death. And I loved the pastor I grew up with, by the way, so I'm not throwing stones at him all low these many years later. But what he said to me basically was, well, it was mob rule. You know, when crowds get together, they do crazy things. And I have to confess, even as a kid, I thought, that doesn't really cut it for me. I don't really, that doesn't help me make sense of this. Now, I'm gonna to try to make this brief, and so I'm not gonna explore everything going on uh, with this, but I wanna say, I guess, uh, three quick things that have to do with time and place and psychological dimensions of what's going on, right? The motivations for some of these characters. So the first thing, time. Again, the book is called 24 Hours That Changed the World. Um, between the time that Jesus is arrested and he is hanging on um, the cross to be crucified is about, I don't know, nine, 10 hours, something like that. So we would call it late Thursday night when he's arrested uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane. And then we're told in Mark at nine in the morning, he's crucified. So that's, a, it's a very compressed amount of time, um, which suggests that all of the events are hurried and chaotic and sort of rushed through. And indeed, when he's arrested, we know uh, the chief priests and scribes want to arrest him where there are not crowds around, lest there be a riot. So they specifically find him somewhere quiet, they arrest him, and they are hoping to push this thing through without any crowds, right? So um, the time is really compressed, and that's related to the second point, which has to do with space. I think if we don't read the story of these, this, what are actually trials, plural, closely, we think, oh, well, Jesus was arrested, he was tried, and then he was crucified. It, even though it's a very compressed amount of space, 
uh, or time, well, time and space, I guess, um, there are actually multiple things that happen. He's arrested. Um, the Sanhedrin, which is the Jewish tribunal, um, tries him in sort of this mock trial. They find him guilty, but now they need to have Pilate ratify the sentence to actually kill him. Um, so that means they've now moved from Gethsemane to uh, the chief priest's house, probably where the Sanhedrin meet. Then they go walk, this is all within the confines of Jerusalem, to Pilate's palace. They hope he's going to ratify their decision to put him to death. Pilate says, yeah, not interested in that. He sends him off to Herod, who I will say, because of uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, I always sort of, if, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but I always sort of imagined that Herod was off in the country somewhere at some estate. He's in Jerusalem too. So they walk a few you know, feet or whatever to Herod's palace. Herod says, yeah, I don't want to deal with him either. And so now they go back to Pilate. And this is where there's this back and forth between Pilate and the chief priest. And basically Pilate, it's a bit of a chess game, gets the chief priest to admit we have no king but Caesar. Pilate thinks he's won at that point, but then the chief priests say to him, well, wouldn't Rome be interested to know that we are the ones on the side of Caesar and you're not willing to put to death someone who's threatening Caesar? It's all, the point is it's all very complicated and because Jesus is on the cross by nine o'clock in the morning, what it means is there is not really a lot of time for anyone else in Jerusalem to figure out what the heck is going on. Small crowds do start to gather, but they're just sort of hearing about this. They don't really understand why Jesus has been arrested. And I will pick up again Dorothy Sayers, who I've talked about before. I, I just can't say enough about this book, The Man Born to be King. She points out that the chief priests and scribes would almost certainly have had people in the crowd encouraging the crowd to shout to release Barabbas because they were so anxious to get Jesus put to death. And on the Barabbas front, um, you know, he's called a, a murderer and a criminal in the Gospels. Another word for that, though, depending on your point of view, would be a patriot, right? You think about in the United States, the Revolutionary War. Uh, those people we call patriots, but Britain would have called them uh, rabble-rousers, murderers, criminals, right? And so there were probably people who had expected to ask for Barabbas um, and were kind of confused that Jesus was now uh, also in prison or being held by Pilate. I mentioned uh, as a final thing, I know this is slightly rambling, apologies, uh, that uh, the psychological dimensions, I'll just say again, some of the players, you've got the chief priests and scribes who are angry at Jesus, who are jealous of him. You've got, don't forget you've got people from the temple whose uh, tables had been upturned by Jesus, they're probably angry at Jesus. You've got Pilate who has gotten into a little bit of trouble with Rome in the past and wants to tread lightly on these issues of Jewish identity. So he's not really anxious to kill Jesus. His wife also, we're told in one of the Gospels, says, you know, don't mess with this guy. But he feels forced and compelled to. And then you, you look at Barabbas, by the way, who may be the first person um, in the world who recognizes that Jesus has saved his life. He is freed because Jesus is going to be put to death in his place, which is worth reflecting on. So I guess the point of this episode is really just to remind us that um, what my pastor said, and again, I loved Pastor Stapleton, and again, I'm not throwing stones, um, was, was too... Um, flip too simple a retelling of the story. The story is filled with richness, it's filled with complications, it's compressed, it's chaotic, it's hard to follow. But because all of that is true, I think it makes it more um, realistic uh, in terms of what ends up a actually happening. Uh, I would love to have your thoughts below. I mean, what speaks to you with this story? What questions do you have? If you get them in in time, maybe they'll even inform how I, I preach about it on Wednesday night. So apologies again for the slightly rambling episode. I hope you learned a little bit today. Uh, and as always, be well, stay in touch, and God bless. Mm -hmm.